Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. David Pugh. I'm a staff scientist at the CALST Visualization Core Laboratory, as well as a certified instructor with software and data carpentry. So software and data carpentry are two global nonprofits devoted to teaching um, core or foundational uh, scientific computing and data science and data analysis skills to um, students and faculty and research scientists, both in academia um, or uh, scientists in industry. And so today we're going to pick up with the third workshop in the CALST uh, Visualization Core Labs Introduction to Data Science Workshop Series, which is on an introduction to Python for data science. So today we are going to be using um, teaching materials provided by or developed by the software carpentry community. And we are going to be using compute resources that are, have been provided by uh, both my colleagues at the research, the IT research computing uh, group here at CALST and also the Binder Hub Federation. So thank you to both of those organizations. Without you, I would not be able to uh, provide today's uh, workshop to such a large group. Uh, looks like nearly 100 people at the moment. Um, um, it just would not be feasible. So thank you very much for providing the computing resources and to Software Carpentry for providing the, the, uh, the teaching materials. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can dive right in because um, we have quite a lot of material to cover today. Okay, so um, as has been the custom, the, the past few weeks, I'm going to be going with kind of a split screen approach. So I'll have the today's uh, lecture materials up on the left hand side. Then on the right hand side, I will have uh, typically the Jupyter Lab instance that I'm using for the, the hands on portion um, and the live demonstration and, and exercises and things like this. Um, so just to kind of quickly cover them, uh, go over what we're going to cover um, through the course of today. <clears throat> Um, so there is more material here than I will be able to cover um, in today's uh, four hour workshop. So typically this is a full day's worth of material, um, like eight hours worth of material. So I'm not going to be able to cover all of it today. Um, so what I'm going to do instead is um, skip around a bit. So I'm going to kind of cover bits and pieces that I think are the most critical and leave um, certain, uh, certain lessons basically for you to kind of go over and dive a little bit more into the details um, uh, on your own time. So um, just at a glance, what I suspect that we will cover is um, episodes one and two. Um, we will skip episode three um, and focus on, uh, six, seven, and eight, which are on um, uh, pandas um, and reading data into data frames. Um, and then we will try to dive into um, for loops, conditionals, and looping over data sets. And then the rest I will probably leave as kind of exercises for, for you. <clears throat> OK, so let's, uh, let's just dive right in. So episode one, running and quitting. So the big question when you're just getting started with Python is how do I, how can I run Python programs? So we're, we're going to talk a little bit today, is, or a little bit in this episode is on um, Jupyter Lab. So I'm going to um, show you the basics of Jupyter Lab um, and help you kind of be able to navigate your way around opening different types of files different types of terminals, different types of notebooks uh, within Jupyter Lab. And then we'll be using uh, primarily Jupyter Notebooks as our, um, as our interface today. Okay, so uh, the first part of this episode walks you through getting started um, with Jupyter Lab. So uh, Jupyter Lab is um, the web-based interface provided by the Jupyter project. So uh, the Jupyter project has been evolving for quite a long time now. It started back um, with something called the IPython console, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit um, about 
uh, in more detail in a few minutes, uh, which was basically just an improved uh, console experience for, uh, for Python. And then it morphed into notebooks. And so some of you might already have been be familiar with Jupyter notebooks or have encountered them or maybe even used them a little bit yourself. And then that has since evolved into Jupyter Lab, which is more kind of all encompassing development environment for, um, for Python. Um, and, and this is where all of the development is, is working now, uh, or is, is going on now, is with the, the Jupyter Lab interface. Um, just seeing a couple questions in chat. Um, oh, so just a few questions in the chat. So no, there is no certificate for attendance. Uh, and the recording of this session will be made available via YouTube and the link will be sent out together with the feedback form probably tomorrow. Once I have the recording uh, posted. Okay. <clears throat> so um, some of the, the setup with JupyterLab, um, we don't need to cover because it's already been done for us and provided in this cloud instance. So some of the, the details involving um, setting up a local install of, of Python that includes uh, Jupyter Lab and, and other things, like we don't need to go into that today. Those of you who joined last week with Con, uh, for the Conda training um, already know a little bit about how to create Conda environments and install Jupyter, um, and Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab. Um, inside of a Conda environment, um, which is what we have, um, which is what I have done to set up this uh, this computing instance. Um, there's a link here to the uh, setup instructions for the Python for these Python lessons, and if you want to get a local install up and running yourself, you can kind of read through here and understand how to install um, Python and JupyterLab and, and things like that on your on your local. I'm not going to cover that uh, today. Okay, so normally when you start Jupyter Lab, uh, you will start it when, uh, with a local install. You'll start it from a terminal. So you'll open up a terminal and you'll type Jupyter Lab and hit enter, and that will launch the Jupyter server in your browser. Uh, or that will launch the Jupyter server and then uh, open the front end um, client in your browser. We don't need to do that because when we click uh, these links, that's all done for us by, um, by Binder Hub. But these are instructions uh, to kind of help you if you are doing a local install. So let's just jump down to the JupyterLab interface uh, itself. Okay, so there are many, JupyterLab has many, many, many features. Um, and I'm only going to kind of scratch the, the surface today, and then we'll do a little bit more uh, when we talk about SQL in two weeks' time. Um, but just to familiarize yourself with the basic mechanics, so um, the, the basic interface for JupyterLab consists of the menu bar, which is this uh, bar right here across the top where we have file um, and edit and view, run, kernel, git, all these other things. So this is where you can use your mouse to kind of access um, many menu uh, many menu items. So you can use the uh, menu bar to launch new notebooks or terminals or text files, things like this. Um, and you'll see some of these are grayed out. These are options that aren't available given the current state of Jupyter Lab, like saving. So we don't have a notebook or a file or anything open to save. So those are grayed out. Um, Things like this. You can also uh, create uh, new notebooks, consoles, or terminals or things just by clicking these little icons here in what is called the main workspace. And that's mostly what we'll be doing, doing today. <clears throat> um, so the left sidebar is this area here. Um, and by default, or the the, the first thing that is displayed in the left sidebar is your is the contents of the current directory in which you launched your Jupyter server. So for us, what is displayed here is the files that are contained in this GitHub repository, because when we launch this GitHub repository on top of uh, Binderhub and expose the JupyterLab server, um, 
we launch that server from within uh, this directory. So that's why the contents that we see here in the GitHub repo are the same contents that we see here. If you were doing this on your local computer, what you would see here would be the contents of the directory where you type the JupyterLab command and hit enter. <clears throat> Um, we can toggle this uh, left or this file browser by, um, you know, clicking, turning this on and off. So that just gives us more space. So sometimes I'll, I'll have this open. I'll do some navigation. Most of the time, I'll just close it just to get extra space in the main work area uh, for demonstration purposes. <clears throat> There's other things in the in the left sidebar. So. If you install um, uh, JupyterLab uh, extensions, which add additional functionality to JupyterLab, many of them will show up in this left sidebar. So there's a Git extension for using Git and GitHub with, from within JupyterLab. Um, we'll talk about that in next week's uh, tutorial. And then there are some other extensions that I've installed here, um, one for a tool called Dask, <clears throat> which um, we won't cover in this um, introduction to data science, but we might cover in future more advanced trainings um, and things like that. JupyterLab is very, one of the reasons it's very popular is that it's very um, extensible and easy to write um, additional uh, or extensions that will provide extra behavior for JupyterLab. And um, there's a whole ecosystem of, of packages um, or extensions rather that um, help add additional features to JupyterLab. So it's a, a thriving ecosystem. Okay, so I see some, um, some of you might be having trouble accessing JupyterLab that there are, are too many users. Um, so what I would suggest is that if you are, if you're from Calst and you're encountering this issue, um, then try the public Jupyter Lab. Um, and <clears throat> if you're outside of Calst and the public Jupyter Lab has too many users, then um, then sorry, um, but we you might have to wait until inevitably somebody will will bow out of the, the workshop a bit early um, and you might be able to join. Um, or these, um, these computing instances will always be available. So if you can't get access to a computing instance right now, um, you can always watch the recording of this workshop and go along, um, say tomorrow, and go through everything on your own. Um, the compute instances will still be there. You can still use them uh, even after this workshop is done. So but apologies if we have hit that, uh, that bound. So the main work area. So the main work area is this area here. And um, it usually consists of a launcher, which is basically just a page where you can click these different icons to launch notebooks or consoles or terminal windows or text files of various flavors, um, things like this. And as you'll see, when you launch many different files, you'll have many different tabs, just like a browser across the top. And the currently active tab will be highlighted with blue. So here we only have one tab open. And you can see that has this blue highlight at the top. OK. So what I would like to do now is to go ahead and create a, uh, a Python script. So um, we can do this by simply clicking the, um, the Python file. So if you go ahead and click on the Python file, so this will create a untitled.py. So a Python script with um, a generic name. And if you go back and you click on the file browser again, you'll see that this file was created in our current working directory. So here we have this untitled.py was created just a few seconds ago in our current directory. If you wanted to create a file in a different location, you could navigate through the browser to that location and then create the file there. So for example, I could navigate into introduction to Python 
and into say the source directory, which is where I would normally create Python scripts. And then here I could do um, either file new Python file or I could click this blue button here to get a new launcher. And now I can click these buttons again, but notice how at the top, we now have a path introduction to Python slash source. So when we, when we see a path at the top of the launcher, we know that any notebooks or consoles that we open or files that we create will be created within that, uh, within that directory. So now if I click on Python file, I get another Python script, untitled1.py, created in that, that same directory. So there are many ways to create new, uh, new, new Python scripts. Um, uh, you can also create them in the lecture notes. They, they show you how to um, create a new text file and then resave it as a Python script by changing the file extension. Um, but a more recent version of JupyterLab that was uh, released um, within the past few months, I think, just now includes um, when you have this click to get this launcher window, there's now just a button that does that automatically for you. So there's no need to do the multiple steps. And again, note like when you go through and you click on the tabs, you can see how the blue tab indicating that the current tab kind of follows you as you as you go through. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and close. Uh, just go ahead and close these uh, for now. And I'll navigate back to introduction to Python. So what about a notebook? Um, so again, Jupyter notebooks are um, very popular um, and probably one of the most widely used um, kind of Python interfaces, particularly in data science, machine learning, scientific computing, because they allow you to um, weave um, text, images, videos together with code. Um, and we're gonna be doing that a lot over the course of today. So for example, if we wanted to create a new notebook, we can just create, um, we can use these buttons to create a new notebook. So I like to keep, when I organize my, my Python projects, I'll often have a source directory well, where I will put Python scripts and then a separate notebooks directory where I will put notebooks. And so if I click on the notebooks directory, so we have introduction to Python slash notebooks here as our, our working directory. And we click on um, Python 3, and this will give us a, uh, a Python 3 notebook. Um, so notebooks are stored in a file format that's called JSON, which is short for JavaScript object notation. Um, like a web page, so it looks, the, the format of the, the data that's saved in the, the notebook file, you know, you can open it and look at it, but it's really meant to be, dis it's written in a particular format so that it can be displayed in a web browser. So that's the, that's the idea. Okay. Um, so, okay, so we have a notebook here. So let's think about um, what else we um, might wanna do. So typically you might have many, um, um, many tabs open at the same time when you're working on a project. So uh, for example, you might have a notebook open, maybe you have a script open, um, we can open a new launcher, and then say, okay, well, maybe we'll have a, um, a terminal window open. Um, what you can do in your main work area when you have these multiple tabs open is you can actually drag and drop them around. So for example, if I wanna have my terminal window be here, and then I can put maybe a script over here, and then I can rearrange these. So for example, I can you know, move this terminal down here. So I just have just a little bit of a terminal going on here. And then, um, 
you know, maybe I have a, a setup like this. And so I might use my notebook to, to prototype some code. So for example, I might try to import a library. Um, so I'll import um, a library called NumPy as MP and um, maybe import another library called pandas as pd and then i will run this code and we'll we'll talk in more details about running this code in a minute but you when you run code in a notebook you use shift and enter so hold down shift and hit enter to run the code and once i know that this code is working then maybe i say okay well i'm done prototyping this code and then i will move it over to my um my Python script, save it in my Python script. And so now I have a Python script. And then down here in the terminal, maybe I might want to run this Python script. Um, and so then we, we would run a Python script and maybe in a terminal. We'll, we'll see some examples of how to do that later. So what I would like you to do now is just take a couple of minutes and practice opening different types of files and just dragging and dropping the, the tabs around and try to organize, organize your main work area um, such that you just get some practice with opening files and things like that and, and get a feel for what your main work area might look like, for example. Okay. So I'll stop sharing my screen for a minute. Um, so there's a question in the chat. Can you repeat how to open the terminal? Sure. So let me, let me just first set a timer so everyone can kind of get some extra practice on, uh, um, on that exercise. And I will sh uh, share my screen again. So if you want to open a terminal, so I'll go down here. I'll just close this. Uh, I'll close this terminal for now. And um, there's a couple of ways that you can open the terminal. So you can always go to File, New. Oops, new Terminal. Yep. And then you, know, you can maneuver around uh, your your terminal, however you wish. So that's one way to do it. Um, alternatively, you can always do um, a new launcher. So if I click a new launcher, um, then I can go and find the terminal here and I can open another terminal and you know again i could uh, you know move this around however i want so now i have maybe two terminals open i mean i generally wouldn't have two terminals open at the same time but you can you obviously can um, have as many open as you wish Okay. Any other questions? So if you're just joining late, so here's the link to the teaching materials with the current um, with the current episode that we're we're current that we're going through. So question in the um, in chat. So is Jupyter Lab for Python um, equivalent to RStudio for R? Um, so yes. Um, so they're not, so okay. So they're equivalent in that they're trying to serve like the same purposes, like an integrated uh, development environment for for Python uh, for Python users. Um, you can actually use Jupyter Lab for not just Python, but you can also use it for, you know, for R or C++ 
or Fortran or Scala or any of the other languages that support the Jupyter uh, kernel spec, uh, which is a little bit more um, detailed than we're going to go um, in this particular training. But if you, uh, programming languages can write an implementation of the Jupyter kernel for that language, and then you can write once you implement that kernel, then you can have notebooks and consoles and things like that for that language. So there's everything from Haskell to Java, C++, Fortran, all have kernels that allow you to run notebooks and, and consoles and things for that language within Jupyter. And we're going to see some examples of this in two weeks time when we run SQL notebooks and SQL consoles where we'll be using an implementation of the Jupyter kernel for the SQL programming language to write SQL queries within JupyterLab. Um, you do not need Jupyter in order to use Python. Um, you can use, um, Python has its own, um, its own terminal, for example, or its own, um, its own console environment. So if we have a, we have a terminal open here, um, if you were to type which uh, Python, um, you can see that the, the Python that we're um, using is the Python for the Conda environment for the uh, Binder Hub instance. So if you were to type Python and hit enter, you would be dropped into the Python, uh, the Python interpreter. So this was the original Python user interface way back in the day. And you could type Python commands like importing a library. And you could do calculator commands and this kind of thing. But you, if you made a typo, then there wasn't a good way to go back and edit it. And there is no graphics or text highlighting or, or anything like that. So typically you don't just use the, the basic Python interpreter, but you can totally use Python, you know, without Jupyter at all. Um, and if we want to exit out of the Python interpreter, I think we type quit with open and close parentheses. But yeah, Jupyter, Jupyter is a uh, very nice to have, but not necessary. Um, ha! Can you share your screen? Yes, of course I can share my screen. Sorry about that. Uh, Share. Okay, let's uh, clear this out. So, if you had a terminal, and um, so the question was, you know, do you need Jupyter to use Python? And the answer is absolutely not. If you have Python, almost every computer has Python installed on it um, in some way, shape, or form. Usually, an operating system will need Python to do things. So, if you opened up a terminal on your Mac or your Linux or a command prompt on Windows and then typed, um, Python and hit enter, you'd be dropped into your Python interpreter. And this is the original Python uh, interpreter that was you that was the user interface for Python way back in the day. And you can type things like, you know, you can import um, packages. So here I'm just typing these uh, commands that I had typed above in the notebook. Um, you could do calculator things, that kind of stuff. But it's not the most user-friendly um, environment. There's no support for multi-line editing. So if I did something like, um, like this, then you know I have to go back and toggle through here and then make the change and it's, it's a little clunky. There's no support for like multi-line editing. So you can't have like here, I have two, two lines of, of, of command um, in one text box, which I can execute as a block. You can't really do that very well here. Um, what, so this is not, Jupyter is a much nicer um, user interface for Python than the basic Python environment or the basic Python uh, shell. I guess. So we won't spend really any time with the Python shell uh, today. Okay. 
So I think now everyone has had plenty of time to kind of go over um, and, and play around a little bit with uh, with JupyterLab. So let's let's head back to notebooks. So today we're going to spend almost all of our time in notebooks. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the terminal. I'm going to get rid of the Python scripts, and I'm going to toggle the file browser off so we have as much room as possible in this um, in this notebook. So let's talk about um, Jupyter Notebooks. So notebooks allow you to uh, mix together uh, code and text. So we'll have, today we'll be building up a notebook that has code cells, like this cell here that has actual Python code in it that we can execute and, and expect to get results from. And then we'll create some text cells where we'll use a language called Markdown to write some nicely formatted text that kind of documents what our code does um, along the way. And you'll get an idea of how these notebooks can be used to kind of mix together code and, um, and text cells. Um, Ah, sorry, I missed a couple of questions in the chat. So one question, what purpose of the different types of windows uh, have you open? So um, the notebook is typically, so this is a good question. So a notebook, which is what we're gonna use today, is typically for, uh, for prototyping work. Um, I use notebooks as kind of like my lab notebook, but for, for code. So all of my data analysis projects all start with notebooks. And once I get to the point where, um, where I am happy that my code is working, it's doing what I think it should do. Um, if I want to then use that code and you know, run it say on a remote cluster somewhere on a much larger data set, then I will uh, refactor my notebook and create a script. So a, a script, an example of a script would be like a .py file. Um, so in this .py file would be the relevant pieces of the notebook that are required to perform the analysis, but in one single file that I could execute without having to independently of Jupyter um, on a remote server um, somewhere. So that's generally how um, the difference between like the notebooks and the Python scripts. Now, everybody has their own kind of preferences in terms of of um, of what they what they would prefer to use, whether you like scripts or notebooks. Some people don't like notebooks at all. They prefer to write everything in scripts. Totally fine. Um, some people just like to use notebooks and never write Python scripts. That's also fine. I tend to find this middle ground where I do a lot of prototyping in notebooks. I also use notebooks to share my work with with others because you can mix and match text cells and code cells and images and video and things like that. It makes it a really handy um, way, to, um, way to share your work with others. Um, so that's, the, that's kind of the difference. And if you, it, there is also a question about what's the difference between Jupyter and Google Colab. So um, Google Colab, took the open source uh, version of Jupyter Notebook and added some proprietary um, extensions and things on top and then launched it as Google Colab about a few years ago. So there's not a lot of difference at all in terms of like the key ideas of, of Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebooks and how and what they're supposed to be used for. It's just that Google Colab has use them to provide an interface into Google Cloud Platform um, in, a, in a way that people are very comfortable with because Jupyter Notebooks are, are so widely used. And they've added a few extra features that are relevant for Google Cloud uh, users. Um, and they've added some really cool features that they have unfortunately kept proprietary. Um, so there's another question. So what distinguishes Jupyter Lab from MATLAB? So there is, um, 
Okay, so the way I would look at this is like, so when I started, um, this is more of a question of like what differentiates say Python from MATLAB. So um, Jupyter Lab is a nice user interface for the Python programming language as well as other programming languages, but we're gonna use it mostly for Python um, and mimics maybe some of the, the UI features that you would see in MATLAB or Mathematica or some of these other uh, proprietary programs. The way to think about, or the way I think about MATLAB versus Python, um, and again, this is only my, you know, my personal subjective opinion. Um, I switched over from MATLAB to Python when I was in graduate school. Um, our department had a site license for MATLAB, but you could only use it on uh, department computers, and um, and I didn't have access to MATLAB on my my laptop. And so instead of getting a, you know, a free version of MATLAB or using Octave, which is an open source MATLAB clone, um, I just decided to invest my time in learning Python, which at the time offered everything that I needed to do in MATLAB in terms of, you know, um, with packages like NumPy and SciPy and, and, uh, and things like that, um, and seemed to be the growing ecosystem, you know, 10 over 10 years ago now when I first started grad school. And I think that that's largely continued till today. I think for me, the, the reason that I use Python in my work is that's because that's what everyone else is using in the data science and machine learning ecosystem. So there's a huge amount of development effort in um, creating packages for doing data science, scientific computing in Python relative to you know other options matlab mathematica things like this um, also from a pragmatic standpoint your know, python is an extremely marketable job skill um, whether you you know continue in academia and want to do your computational science or work in academia or if you want to go uh, you know and leave uh, academia and get a job in a commercial uh, enterprise somewhere so python is a very um, marketable job skill, whereas I, my personal experience is that MATLAB is much more niche and uh, focused heavily on a on few engineering disciplines. So that's my subjective opinion on the Python um, JupyterLab MATLAB uh, stance. Uh, good questions, though. Okay, so back to notebooks. So notebooks have um, command modes and edit modes. So Command mode um, is when so let's let's start with the edit mode. So edit mode is the is the mode that we're we're most often in. So we're in edit mode when we have this green or this sorry this blue um, box here. Our boxes our our cell is outlined in blue, and we're editing. We're typing commands. So maybe we're typing two plus two. And then we're evaluating code with shift and enter. And so that gives us, um, that gives us four, of course. Um, if we want to go to command mode, you can press escape. And notice that the blue box that was around the cell is now gone. So now we're in command mode. And in command mode, we can use keyboard shortcuts to do things like um, there is a uh, Command A, I'm oh, sorry, um, escape. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, there we go. So, so let me just type something. So, this is a cell. So, I'm editing, I'm in edit mode now, and I'm editing the contents of this cell. <clears throat> and then I can evaluate the contents of the cell by hitting shift and enter. Now, if I go back to the cell, I can hit escape to go from edit mode to command mode. And then in command mode, I can use keyboard shortcuts. Like I can press the letter A and that creates a new cell above the old cell. So now I'm in edit mode again. And so this is the cell I created above. The original cell. And if I hit 
escape to go into command mode. If I hit B, that will create a new cell below. So created below the original cell. So here's a cell that I want to delete. So if I have a cell that I want to delete, I can hit escape to go to the command mode and then hit X, which will delete the cell. And then if I hit escape to make sure I'm in command mode and I hit Z then or Z, then that undoes the previous command. So that in this case, it un, uh, undeleted the cell that I had deleted. So in these, uh, these commands are, are documented over here in the, uh, in the lecture notes. There's quite a few more um, uh, keyboard uh, shortcuts. So in the help menu, you can find a whole bunch of, of help references for, for different libraries even, as well as um, references for Jupyter and JupyterLab, um, things like that. And there's a whole bunch more uh, keyboard shortcuts, but we're not going to uh, we're not going to go into them. Okay. So, so I'm going to hit Escape to go to Command Mode and hit B to add a cell below. And um, so this cell. So we've been doing code up until now. We've been doing code cells. Even these cells here are technically code cells. I added this this character, the, uh, the hash symbol, which is what's used to create comments in Python. So code that isn't going to be, code that will be ignored and not executed. So these are technically all code cells here. Um, but we can also create text cells. And there are a few ways that you can create a text cell. One, you can just use your mouse and you can click on a cell and you can come up here to where it says code and you can select cell types and you can select say markdown and now in this cell i can type markdown code markdown which is a, a text markup language um, that allows you to do all sorts of stuff and we'll i'm going to show you some examples here so um this is a header in markdown and now when you hit shift enter and evaluate that it renders this cell is as markdown. And if you double click on it, you can go back and edit it. So here is how to add a bullet list. And you hit shift and enter to evaluate the cell, and then it renders it in, uh, in Markdown. So you can go through and you can have these code cells and these Markdown cells and have almost like a self-documenting bit of code, or you can even write whole papers or books even in uh, Jupyter Notebooks. There is um, there's a software called Jupyter Book, which allows you to take collections of Jupyter Notebooks and turn them into, uh, turn them into a book. There is software that allows you to take a Jupyter notebook and convert it into a LaTeX uh, typeset PDF, like you might submit to a journal. Um, there's quite a lot of, uh, of interesting infrastructure built up around uh, Jupyter Lab and Jupyter notebooks. Okay. So if you want to know, so the difference between command mode and edit mode. So anytime you click on a cell, you're going to be in edit mode. So just clicking on a cell is going to put you in edit mode. You'll see this blue box around the cell, and then you'll see a blinking cursor inside the cell. And in, in edit mode, if you hit um, shift and enter, then it will execute. Um, the code cell and return the result. So here you would get four. Now, if you typed code, accidentally typed code into a text cell. So for example, um, suppose 
I have this cell here and I accidentally had turned it into a markdown cell and then I did two plus two and I hit shift and enter to execute that. So here I'm not getting a result and I might be confused as to why that is the case. But if you click on the cell, you can look up here and you see that it's markdown. And if you go back and you change the code, then it will go back to being code. And then if you evaluate a code cell, you'll get results. If you're ever in doubt about whether you're in edit mode or command mode, you're probably in edit mode. And if you want to hit escape, escape will always take you from edit mode into command mode. So you can just hit escape a few times and then check, and then you'll know that you're in, in command. Okay. Um, so in Markdown, you can use bulleted lists, you can create numbered lists, you can do sub lists, you can do headings and, and subheadings. Um, you can embed links. Um, so if you wanted to embed um, a link, so I'll go in here and say, um, so this is the link to today's teaching materials. And then the text that you want to include in the link, you put in square brackets, and then the link itself, you would put in um, inside of parentheses. And I'll just delete this part of the link. And then if I hit uh, shift and enter, then I'll have a link. And if I uh, click on the link, it will take me to that, that particular page. And if you double click on, again, on the markdown cell, it will allow you to go in and edit the markdown cell. Um, right. So there are some exercises here. Um, so let's take a few minutes and, and take a look at those exercises. They're mostly on, uh, on markdown cells and get some practice with just, just get some practice creating cells, code cells and markdown cells and, you know, do some simple, um, mathematical exercises like calculator arithmetic and things like that. Um, and then, um, you can also ask, ask questions. So I'm gonna just stop sharing for just a minute. The number turns orange with the dot. What does that mean? Uh, now I need to share my screen again. Okay. So orange with a dot. So I bet, right, I bet like this. So orange with a dot. So this is actually a new feature in JupyterLab. It indicates that you have a cell that has been edited but not run. So previously, I had this cell that had two plus two, and then this result was four because I had executed the cell. But if I go in here and I make a change, then JupyterLab kind of tells me that, hey, you've made edits to this code cell, but you haven't rerun the code cell to generate a new result. So you know, the result, the code in this cell might not produce this output anymore because you've changed it, which is true because now I've, instead of two plus two, now I've got two minus two. And if I execute this cell again, then I get the new answer and then the orange bit goes away. And now when I click on it, it's blue again. So hopefully that answers, uh, that answers the question. So it's, it's a nice feature in that, um, it lets you know when you have code that hasn't been um, executed yet. Okay, so take a few minutes. I'll set my timer to make sure that we're staying on task and have a look through uh, these exercises and then let me know if you have any questions.
Okay, so since nobody seems to have any questions, I'm just going to um, continue to demo a few things whilst giving you a time, giving you all some time to look at work on some more exercises. So one of the nice things, uh, particularly when you're you know, doing scientific work, is the ability to um, render mathematical equations inside the notebook. So um, I'm going to go escape into command mode. I'm going to create a new cell above, and I'm going to make it a markdown cell. And then I'll just do a, so here's a subheader. So you can use um, uh, LaTeX, which is a, a language for uh, typesetting for typesetting in general, but most often used to typeset documents that have lots of mathematical expressions or math uh, equations or formulae. Um, and you can write uh, LaTeX inside of Markdown cells. And JupyterLab is smart enough to, when it parses the Markdown cell, which just kind of like goes through and reads the Markdown syntax. It can identify the little LaTeX blocks and then render them um, using a, a LaTeX renderer in the browser. So you can write uh, mathematical expressions. So you can do things like E raised to the uh, pi pi is one is zero. And when you hit shift and enter to evaluate that cell, it renders this block in LaTeX, which is very nice. Um, and I think that's the right. That's the right version of it. Somewhere in here. Oh, plus one. Shoot. I got it a little bit wrong. Of course, plus one. And I will put formula. So there's a link. Um, and if you want, instead of a, if you want this math equation to be like centered, which I often do because I'm slightly pedantic about formatting and things, then you can just add um, two dollar signs and then that will center the line of the math equation. So if you are an advanced uh, you know, LaTeX guru, then you can, do all of your normal LaTeX stuff that you would do for formatting mathematical equations inside of uh, these markdown cells, and they should just work in the way that you would expect them to work. So you can do align blocks and formula blocks and all kinds of things like that. Um, if you want to do multi-line formulas and all that stuff. So, okay, right. So I think I, I've kind of covered, I went through this in quite a lot of detail because you know, it's just always good for you to know your way around um, before we start actually writing Python code. Um, so hopefully, are there any other questions about JupyterLab or like just the basic mechanics of, of using JupyterLab? Because the rest of the day is going to kind of, I'm just going to do this stuff and we're going to focus more on actually writing Python code. So, could you mix languages like Python, R, and Bash in a single notebook? So yes, you can actually. Um, so for example, um, there are a few ways to do this. The, the simplest way is to use um, something called uh, cell magics. So cell magics are special commands within, um, within Jupyter that allow you to change the, um, interpreter that's used in an individual cell to execute the code in that cell. So the simplest one would be something like bash. Um, so if we do percent percent bash, um, 
then we can write um, code in this cell and it will be executed as if you had written a bash code um, um, in, a in a bash terminal. So if we did something simple like ls-l and evaluate that, then we get the results of what is written or what would be in the working directory of the, the notebook. So, um, so for example, if we did, um, so let me change this to PWD for print working directory. So we can see that this is in fact, the directory that this notebook was created in. And then if we do the same again, we could do ls-l, we could see that, okay, these files in that directory, um, you know, you could do multi-line things. So we could do, you know, if you came to the bash course, we did four loops in bash. So you could do for um, I um, in, let's see. So for, let's just say file name in uh, or, even better. So you could do for a notebook in anything that matches the IPy uh, notebook extension. Do um, and then echo notebook. So here, this is actually executing a. a a for loop in bash and it's just printing the ah and i've made a mistake in here dollar sign notebook so dollar sign is from our bash workshop you need to use dollar sign to access the name of this notebook variable and so this echo statement just prints the, the file name so, so that's an example you can also do um if you have if in your software environment where Jupyter is running, you have um, files to support other programming languages, you could actually use like R magics or Haskell magics or SQL magics to write uh, code with those programming languages in individual cells and execute the code and get results. Okay. Um, so there's a question about subscripts and superscripts in Python. I'll answer that in a minute. Um, we will, um, when we get to actually writing Python code. So this formula that I wrote here is written in inside of a markdown cell using a markup language or using a type, mathematical typesetting language called LaTeX. So um, you can read more about that in this last um, uh, exercise here. It talks about uh, LaTeX uh, formatting and things like that, but it's not in Python. So we'll talk about Python uh, in a minute. Okay, any other questions before we move on? So shift and enter doesn't work. Um, hmm. So for those of you, so there are at least two of you for whom shift enter doesn't work. So if you type in a cell that says code two plus two and hit shift and enter, you get nothing. Try, uh, so try creating a new notebook. Um, maybe something has gone wrong in the top right hand corner. Does it say uh, Python three? Ah, so this is what I was suspecting. So if you're, for some reason, your kernel was disconnected, which um, shouldn't happen, but maybe it could happen. 
it should say Python 3 up here in the top right corner. And if it says kernel disconnected, if you just click on that and select Python 3, then you should be working again. So here, if you click on this and then you select Python 3, then it should be working again. Cool. OK, good, good, good. So that can happen. I Normally, that happens if there's some kind of um, um just like minor connection issue or something like that or or if your notebook crashes then you'll have to reconnect the kernel um so should it always be in a kernel so yes so the i kind of glossed over this detail because it's a bit technical but um the notebook itself the notebook itself is is just like a a nice visual representation of the computation that you're doing what happens when you type code in a notebook cell and hit shift and enter, then the notebook takes that code, kind of puts it in a little message and sends it to the kernel. And the kernel is what's running in the background on either a remote server or on your laptop or workstation. And the kernel receives this message, it opens it up, it reads the code that's written there, and then it executes the code on your computer. So if the notebook isn't connected to a kernel, then the notebook isn't going to work because it doesn't have anything to do the computation, which is why you were hitting shift enter and you were getting no results. So you can work in the terminal directly, but then you don't get all the extra, well, I would, if, if you think it's better to work in the terminal directly, I would encourage you to test that hypothesis by working directly in the terminal with Python and then see if you prefer that to, um, to working in a notebook or in, in a different user environment. Um, typically, you don't get disconnected from the kernel very often. OK, so moving on to the next episode. Variables and assignment. Okay, so in this episode, we're going to talk about um, storing data in programs, and we're going to just write some simple uh, Python assignment statements. So I'm going to come down here. I'm going to hit Escape and A to create a markdown cell, and I'm just going to call this uh, variables and assignment. And this is a code cell. So I am going to uh, change it to a markdown cell. OK. So the equals operator is what's used to assign a value to a variable. So we could take a value like 42 and, and assign it to a variable, which usually has some English language name um, called age. And then if we hit Enter, we can do another assignment in the same code cell. So we can create a variable called first name and assign the value of Ahmed to it. And if we hit shift and enter, then these assignment statements are executed and their values, 42 and Ahmed respectively, are assigned to the variables age and first name. And then once that code has been executed, we can reference these variables in other cells. So if we type age and hit shift and enter, we'll get the value 42. Um, there's some conventions with, uh, with variable names. So you can only use letters, digits, and an underscore. Um, so underscores are typically used to separate um, uh, multiple words in the same variable name. So like first name, for example, first underscore name. Um, Variables are variable names are case sensitive. Um, so um, these all these different capitalization patterns of age are, are three different variables. Um, typically, variables are all lowercase letters. So you, all the variables that I write will be use only lowercase letters, um, digits and, and underscores. Um, variable names, it's usually not a good idea to start variable names with an underscore um, because that pattern that mean, has a special meaning within Python. Um, so we don't 
we're not going to use leading underscores until we understand kind of that, that special naming convention. Um, when you're in a uh, when you're in a notebook, uh, or you can use the the print uh, the print function to uh, display values. So we can use the print function, and then we can do uh, first name comma is comma age comma years old. And then when I hit shift and enter, then that code is executed. And the print function um, basically concatenates together all of the values that you put, um, you put in here um, and adds a space between them by default. So that's why you get the spaces added between these things. And notice that if um, I'm passing here some values is and years old, as well as some variables, first name and age. So if there's a variable passed, Python will substitute the very the value associated with that variable before displaying the result. Now, when you're in a notebook, you don't necessarily have to use the print statement to display values. You can just write the name of the variable and evaluate that and it will display its value. However, um, when you're writing Python scripts, you need to use the print statement in order to display, uh, display values. Um, so I typically, any, anything that I know that I definitely want to display, I'll just put a print statement around it and won't rely on the notebook to just display it. Uh, for me. Um, so variables need to be created before they're used. So for example, if I tried to do something like last name and evaluate that, I'll get this type of error. And so this is our first error that we've seen in, in Python. You will uh, get used to them. Uh, but this is what the, um, uh, an error typically looks like. So it'll have um, the type of error, in this case, a name error. It will have hopefully some helpful information about the comp that, what that error is, and then um, some indication of the context in the code of where this error occurred. In this case, there's only a single line and it points to that line and said, this, this variable is not defined. That means that there is no value associated with it um, already. So um, we would need to go back and assign uh, some value to that variable like we did up here in order to get rid of this error. OK. Uh, and we've already seen how variables kind of can persist between cells. And um, so the print statement, so here, the, the commas, so this is a print, sorry, this is a, this function print. Commas, when you use, when we evaluate or when we call Python functions, commas are used to separate multiple arguments to a function. So here, the commas are what separate these, um, these arguments that are passed into the function. So the, the commas are, are not printed here um, in the result. And we will talk about, there's another question in the chat about how to create vectors, matrices, and arrays in Python. And the answer also provided by somebody else in the chat is with the NumPy library. And we will, we're going to focus on pandas later. Pandas uses NumPy under the hood, uh, but since there's a question about it, I will go ahead and say um, NumPy. So the NumPy project is how you create uh, n-dimensional arrays, which would include vectors and matrices as uh, subtypes in Python. So NumPy, you should think of NumPy as the um, MATLAB clone uh, for Python. It has actually many of the same functions in MATLAB with the same names and things like that. Uh, we're not going to be using NumPy directly, only indirectly via pandas later. But if you're 
super interested in diving into array computing and Python, then NumPy is the place to get started with that. Okay, um, so we can use variables in calculations. So if we wanted to take the variable age and um, add three, that would give us 45. We could also reassign that variable um, to that new value. Um, and now, um, if we um, ran this code, I'm getting an error. Uh, fist name, indeed, fist name is not defined. First name is defined. Now notice here also that it had this, this um, red dotted line underneath. So that indicates that there's something wrong that the Python um, or Jupyter has detected something wrong with this code before it even runs it. Um, and, um, and indeed, there was something wrong with the code. I, I had made a typo. So now this new value for age is what is accessed when it's replaced here. So we get 45 instead of 42. And if I ran this code again, and then ran this code again, go to 48, and so on and so forth. OK. Um, so and Python, so the, next we're going to talk about indexing in Python. So let's suppose that we have um, Adam name and we give a string helium. Okay, and again, shift enter to execute the cell. Now, if we, we can do indexing in Python using square brackets. So you put square brackets and then a number and in Python indexing starts at zero. So this is different than um, um, than some other programming languages, in particular R is one-based indexing. MATLAB might also be one-based indexing, um, but Python is zero-based indexing. Um, so if we put atom zero, <coughs> atom name, square brackets, zero, then that selects out the, the zeroth element in the string helium. Um, you can do slicing so you can select multiple um so you do zero up to but not including the third element and so that gives us hel um just as an example um you can also do uh negative indexing so there's a handy way to get access to the last element in a sequence using negative indexing. Uh, and this also works um, for other elements. So you can go even further back. Um, you can also do, um, you could go three from the end up to not including the last one. So there, there's quite complicated slicing that you can do to select out. And here we're doing a simple string, but the same will work for other data types like lists um, and, and things like that. Um, and we're going to use the same kind of slicing in this, uh, slicing syntax when we look at uh, pandas data frames in a little bit. And also will look work on NumPy arrays as well. Um, there's other built-in functions. So there's a built-in function called length, which you can use to look at the length of things. In this case, we'll look at the length of atom names. So that gives us six. Um, so use meaningful variable names. So we've talked about creating, creating variables. So you might be tempted to use variable names like x and y and z or i and j and k. 
uh, things that are like might be used in mathematical notation, I would discourage you from doing that um, and try to use meaningful variable names. Um, so one of the one of the um, nice things about Python code is it's um, Python is a language that focuses on readability of code. And so when you see well-written Python code, it will read um, as English, or it will read very close to, to English in terms of an English explanation of what that code is doing. Um, and we'll see some more examples of that, but it only works if you use meaningful variable names. Okay. Um, so there are some exercises here. So I'd like you to take five minutes and have a look at these exercises. Uh, and I'll give you an opportunity to ask some questions. And maybe I'll do a couple exercises and then we'll move on to the next, uh, the next episode. So for the next five minutes, if you could just take a look at those exercises, get some practice um, with assigning uh, values to variables um, and, and things like that. So if anybody is just joining late, so here's the link to the teaching episode that we're on. Um, and here is a link to the GitHub repo. And then if you click one of the links in the top of the, the readme file in the GitHub repository, you can get access to the computing resources that we're using for today. And the recording, <clears throat> the recording again will be made available on YouTube um, probably tomorrow once I've had a chance to edit it. Okay, um, so since there don't seem to be any questions and I still want you to give, take a few more minutes to have some opportunity to work on those exercises. So I will be back. Oh, there's another question. So the, the so Jupiter in the notebook, it should be auto completing like, um, uh, parentheses for you. Um, let me share screen. So it should auto complete parentheses and brackets and things like that. So if I were to do something like um, print, then um, oh, it doesn't, why is it not doing that? Hmm. This is a very interesting observation. I've uh, it used to do auto completion of brackets and things. Hmm. You know what, this is a good observation. So, uh, hmm. so Jupyter Notebooks used to auto complete like brackets and parentheses and things like that. Um, I'm going to have to Google and find out why that doesn't seem to be working here. Um, 
because it has always worked like that in the past. So that's a very interesting observation. So thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna make a note of that and try to find out what is going on uh, because it should. I'm not quite sure why. Okay. Uh, so yes, so the question is, can you access these materials as PDF files? So yes, you can. Um, let me just quickly share my screen. So I believe if you scroll up to the top and you click on this like hamburger menu icon here, there, there should be um, an all-in-one page that I think you can get the whole lecture notes in one page, and then you can save that down as a PDF. Okay. Um, okay, so any, uh, any last minute questions before, um, before we move on to the next episode? Nope, okay. Cool. So let's move on to the next, the next episode. Okay, so the next episode is data type and type conversion. So I'm, I'm actually gonna skip this episode and try to move on to some more um, advanced material. It, this episode just talks about at a, a lower level of detail that I think is probably necessary, the differences between ints integers, floating points, and strings, and some of the basic data types in Python. So I think this information is probably a little bit too, too detailed for today. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and leave it to you as an exercise for the viewer. And also, um, built-in functions and help. Um, we, I want to get to the data analysis portions of this, so we'll not spend so much time on, on the simple built-in functions. If we encounter built-in functions later, I'll, I'll just talk about them um, um, as we go along. And also um, help, um, I will also talk to you about the different, um, the, the different ways to get help um, as, we, as I use them um, in the course of the tutorial today. So I don't think we need to go into that in too much detail. And we'll, we'll, actually now might be a good time to take a break since we have been going for about an hour and a half. So let's take a short break, um, just a five minute break, um, stretch your legs, maybe get a cup of tea and we'll come back at uh, 2.40. And, uh, and then we'll, we will pick up with, um, libraries and then we'll dive into we'll go through libraries very quickly and then we're going to dive right into doing data analysis and data frames so we're going to take a five minute break and i'm just going to go ahead and pause the recording okay welcome back everyone so we're back on recording again so let us jump right back in with libraries. Okay. Um, so in this episode, we're gonna talk about how to use software that other people have written, how to find out what that software does. And then we're just gonna talk about how to you know, use libraries basically in, in Python. So um, what is a library? So a library is a collection of files, sometimes called modules, that contain code that is used by other software programs. It could also contain data values, like numerical constants or, or things like that. Um, so Python, when you, when you install Python, it comes with it, or it comes with a, a standard collection of libraries that these are part of the Python standard library. And there's a link here to the Python standard library for I think, the most recent version of Python. And 
uh, you can see that just glancing through here, there's quite a lot of libraries. So each of these individual uh, links here goes to a different library that is part of the standard library. So there's things for text processing. Um, there are different data types. Um, there are numeric and mathematical modules. Um, there's stuff for accessing <clears throat> files and directories. Um, this pathlib is particularly useful. I use that a lot in my own work when I need to reference paths to data files or paths to output files, things like this. Um, there is uh, libraries for doing data compression and archiving. Um, these are very useful. I use them sometimes to compress input data or compress output data. Um, there are kind of some miscellaneous ones. There's arg parse. So arg parse I use a lot for creating command line um, options so that when I run my my machine learning jobs on Ibex on our remote cluster computer here at Calst, I often want to modify these programs um, at the command line and as part of my job script. And you can use the library called argparse to um, learn how to do that for your Python scripts. That's very, uh, very useful. There's things for parallelizing code um, and all kinds of stuff. Some of this other stuff is I use less frequently, but there is quite a lot, quite a lot in there. And OK. So in addition to the Python standard library, just like R has a whole ecosystem of, of uh, user provided or user created packages, Python does as well. And these are all hosted on the Python package index. So on the Python package index, this is like, um, if you're familiar with R, R has something called CRAN, which is the, like the repository of, of R libraries and packages. Py, the Python package index is the same uh, functionality, but for Python. So you can go through here and you can search for, you know, different Python packages. And for example, if you wanted to search for PyTorch, you know, so here is um, anything that has PyTorch in the name. Um, and interestingly, so this PyTorch is not the, the PyTorch that one would expect to get um, because that's right, on Python or on the Python package index, Torch is the package that not PyTorch, even though the package is called PyTorch, it's Torch is the package. So this is the um, PyTorch, the Python package for uh, doing deep learning that's most widely used here at Calst um, and very widely used elsewhere around the world as well, as you can see um, from the GitHub statistics, it has a lot of users. Um, another one, so someone, you know, NumPy, you can find NumPy in here. So here is NumPy. Um, and you can search for other packages and, and things like that. Um, but when we, um, the Python package index is kind of the one-stop shop for all of the, your Python packages. Uh, where are we? Okay. Um, if you want to use a library that is um, that has already been installed, you must import it before you can use it. So um, math is one of the modules in the Python standard library. So we can import math. And now that we've imported math, we can use uh, the contents of the library. So for example, if we do math and hit dot and, and just wait a minute, what we'll see is basically, so this is some of the help menus for the different, uh, for the contents of the math uh, library. So we can use our arrow keys to kind of toggle through here and see these are different. So these are all various uh, trigonometric functions, more trig functions. So here's an example of a mathematical constant. Um, and 
other functions. So here's the exponential function, um, factorial function. And you can just kind of scroll through here and see all the different um, simple mathematical functions that, uh, that we have available. So, um, and as you, um, as you type, you can hit tab and this will basically pull up anything that starts with a P in, as in this example. So I, I hit P, I hit tab, this pulls up anything in the math package that starts with a P. And so I can, I was looking for math.py and if we hit shift and enter to evaluate this, we see we get um, a floating point representation of the constant pi. Um, and another example of help menu. So if you put a question mark after something and evaluate it, you will often get the help menu or the help um, information about that object or that uh, variable or function or whatever it is. Okay. Um, we can combine um, things together. So we could do math um, cosine of pi, we can get minus one. We could do that uh, Euler's formula from earlier. So we could do um, math dot um, exp, and then we had math dot pi, and then there is there should be some way in here to do um, a complex number j. Hmm. Maybe you can't do complex arithmetic with this. Um, so let's look at the documentation. I'm surprised that this isn't working, but I've never actually tried it in a class before. So um, E raised to the power of X. Okay, so from the documentation, the exponential function that is implemented in the math library uh, requires a floating point number um, and not a complex number. So if I wanted to do uh, a complex um, power, then I would need to use a different implementation of the exponential function. So maybe I need to use NumPy, the exponential function in NumPy or something for that to work. Um, so my teaching example turned out to not work as well as I hoped. Um, that's okay. Sometimes those things don't pan out. So what was I going to do? <clears throat> okay. Um, notice that we have to have, we have to do math.cos and math.pi um, or, you know, math.sign of math.pi. And um, things like this. So that's because anytime we want to use something from the math library, we need to we need to prepend the math dot and then the thing from the library. If we wanted to use um, use specific functions directly, we could import them. So we could do um, from math import um, cosine sine pi and maybe tan for tangent. So once we've imported these things, then we could use them directly. So we could do something like the sine of pi divided by the cosine of pi, and then the tangent of pi. So if we import individual items from a library, we can use them directly. Otherwise we can import the whole library and then use that library uh, name to reference the things that we want to use.
Um, <clears throat> now, a way to get around that. So first off, I don't really like importing individual elements from libraries. And the reason is that if you import something by an individual name and you have something that already has that name as a variable, then the thing that you import will overwrite your the variable that you define. Okay. And so what I always I will typically import not import individual items, but rather favor importing the library and using this notation math dot math dot. But that gets a bit cumbersome. So a, maybe a better way would be to import math and use something called an alias. So we import math as M. And then we can go through and we can do m dot cosine of m dot pi and reference things like that. Now, whenever you are um, you want to use a library, you need to you need to import it every time. So, but you, or you need to import it once. So you either need to import it once. Usually, you know, for a notebook that I was using in my own work, I would probably gather all my import statements at the top of the notebook and put them in one cell. Um, or in a script, all the import statements would come at the top of the script. And then when that script is run, or you execute the first cell in this notebook, it would import all the libraries that you were going to use um, for that notebook or in that script. But if you start a new script or a new notebook, then you're going to need to import the libraries again. Now, importing a library is not the same as installing a library. So you can't, uh, you can't use a library in a script or notebook without importing it. And you can't import a library that you haven't already installed. So um, for example, there is, let me see if I can show you what an import error might look like. So if I try to import uh, SimPy as, Right. Okay. So there is a um, a library for doing um, symbolic mathematics in Python called SymPy, and um, it's a very powerful, super interesting library uh, for doing symbolic mathematics, like um, that you might get in like Maple or Mathematica or things like that. Um, but I didn't install it inside of the uh, software environment that we use in uh, this workshop series because symbolic mathematics is not something that is really done in data science. So this is more for you know other other branches of of um, science and mathematics. So it's not installed, and this is the type of error that you will see if you're trying to import a um, import a package that has not been installed. So to fix this error, I would have to install the SimPy package, and then I could run this code. Import error. <clears throat> okay. Um, so there's a, a built-in function called help, which you can use um, to look up the um, some documentation um, on the module. So this is basically just everything that we can find using the question mark, but accessing the individual functions. So for example, so here's cosine, um, you know, instead of, you know, printing out this huge document to the screen, which we can actually get rid of by clicking this um, um, little button over here to hide that long output, um, we could again do math dot cosine and question mark um, and hit shift and enter. And it will just get the input for that um, or get the documentation for that individual function. Uh, you can also just hit tab and you'll get similar information. Um, in this case, you're seeing not just cosine, but uh, hyperbolic cosine as well. So anything that starts with COS. <clears throat> OK, uh, so we talked about importing specific items. We talked about import alias. Um, OK, so let's take uh, 
five minutes and have a go at these exercises. And then there's a couple in here, um, this one in particular, this jigsaw puzzle we'll do together because I think it's, um, it illustrates some basic things about writing Python code. So I'm gonna set the timer for five minutes and please have a go at these exercises. Um, and then we'll come back and do one or two of them together and then we'll move on. And in the meantime, while you're working on exercises, I'll be happy to answer any questions that, uh, that you might have. Um, and I know that, uh, that there might be a wider range of uh, experience in, in using Python. So obviously this, this workshop assumes nothing about your knowledge of Python and starts with very basic questions. But if you are, if you already have some experience in Python programming and you want to use this kind of downtime to ask me more advanced questions, then please, please do. And I'll do my best to answer them um, and provide links or, or whatever to more, um, um, more advanced uh, materials. While you guys are sitting there, I just went ahead and launched the poll. And uh, as I'm curious about the pacing.
pacing is always a difficult thing to get right and and with such a large group and such a diverse background and experience levels i would guess so That little alarm sound says the five minutes are up on the um, on the exercise timer. So let's. I'm going to share my screen. You can keep answering the poll. I'll, I'll leave it open. Um, so let's. So I wanted to work through a couple of these these things, these exercises. So the first is locating the right module. So we have um, just going to copy and paste this. So we have this um, string of letters, which looks like a, a, a random combination of A's, C's, T's, and G's um, so assigned to the variable bases. And we would want to select a random character from the string. Um, so, so here's our. Uh, basis string. And of course, we can select um, by an index using square brackets, like we did uh, earlier. But what we want is a way to randomly generate integers so that we can go through here and, and select uh, different individual, an individual base at random. And so looking through the standard library, we want to try to find a, a a library in the standard in the standard libraries that would work for us. So um, we might want to ah here we go. So numeric and mathematical modules. There looks like there is a random uh, library for generating pseudo random numbers. So that's probably what we want. Um, so if we go in here to our basis code and we um, and we uh, import the random um, library. And I'll just comment that out. So we'll import the random library. And then let's see what we have in here. So random dot. And so we have all of these different functions in here for generating um, random numbers it looks like from different distributions so what we want is like a random integer <clears throat> so here looks like random integer so rand int and let's do zero and uh, the length of bases. And let's just execute this code. Okay, so if we execute this over and over, uh, we can get different random integers, it looks like. So we could also assign this to uh, random index. And then we could say bases random index. So now this looks like it's doing kind of what we we want it to do. So we can go through here and we're executing this code differently and we're getting a different random um, letter from uh, the basis from basis. Now, so if you weren't following along, so I kind of did um, already what uh, this jigsaw puzzle, which basically rearranged some code 
um, in order to achieve the same the same result. But I did it a little bit differently. And so now I'm actually curious as to what the RAND range um, Ah, so this rand range function fixes the problem with rand int, which includes the endpoint. So in Python, this is usually not what you want. And so what is the problem with this code? So we, it seems like we haven't seen a problem with this code yet. It doesn't seem to be generating any errors. Um, so let's try to figure out what's going on here. So if we do the rand um, uh, rand int from zero, let's try this. Okay. So here, remember when we talked about slicing and we said that um, slicing and indexing in Python goes from the start up to but not including the uh, the stop. Well, here, rand int includes the um, includes the the stop. So this code zero and one will give you randomly either zero or one, including obviously including one. So if we execute this code a bunch of times, we get zero and one. But usually, when we're doing um, when we're, we're solving this problem, we only ever want the random numbers to be either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10. So we don't want, we would never want to get an 11. And if we look at the length of the bases variable, it is in fact 11. So this code, might sometimes generate an 11, which would generate an error. Because if we tried to do um, this, we would get an index out of range error, which means that there is from, remember Python is zero indexed. So there is no index 11 um, character in this string. There's only zero through 10. So this code has a subtle bug, which is which might not be obvious, um, but maybe we could engineer if we did this. So here, this length basis will evaluate to two now because we've I've forced this to just take the first two characters. And so this function now will generate sometimes zero, sometimes one, and sometimes two. But if it generates a two, then that will generate this error. So it's less obvious because as the number of bases gets longer, the likelihood of you and generating an index equal to the length of bases also goes down. Um, so it's a bit of a subtle bug, but if we, we can correct this by, so I'm just copying and I'll put that down here. We can correct this by using uh, rand range um so this will never generate an 11. yeah and we don't actually need the import statement down here since we've already imported it once okay so i covered a lot of different topics in that uh, example uh, exercise there um so any questions about that before we move on to um, doing some data analysis in pandas?
Okay, cool. So moving right along. So reading tabular data into data frames. Yes, yeah, so just to reiterate, by switching to RAND range, we corrected the issue with the index. That RAND int um, has, um, has in it. Uh, that would also work. So uh, one of the um, one of the participants has said that you could do um, uh, an alternative solution, which I will put here, uh, would be to do the length of bases minus one. So this will also never generate an 11. So this will only ever go zero to uh, 10. So that's an alternative solution. So um, the key, remember, so Python is zero index. And if you see an index out of error, that means that somehow you're off by, off by one in your your indexing code, and you'll need to um, uh, you'll need to kind of go back and figure out what's going on. Okay. Um, hold on, just one second. Somebody has come to uh, has come to my door, so I am going to. Okay, so we're recording again. Share my screen. Okay. Okay, so in this episode, we're going to start in on using the pandas library. So the pandas library is, is probably the go to library for doing tabular data analysis in Python. Um, and I'm going to show you how to load some CSV files into uh, a data frame for an anal for analysis. Okay. So again, we're going to use pandas. So that's a library for doing statistics on tabular data. So tabular data just means like rows and columns. So typically, um, the columns are going to represent uh, features or variables um, in our data, and rows are going to represent observations of our data. Um, and so that's what I mean by tabular tabular data. So it's two-dimensional uh, two dimensional data. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import the pandas library. So the canonical st uh, import statement is to import pandas as PD. And then we're going to read in some data. So um, so we can do PD and then hit tab. And pandas is a pretty big library, so sometimes it takes a little bit for the um, for all of the information about what's in pandas to load. But there is a read CSV function, which is quite complex. There's a lot of options in this read CSV function. Um, but we are the first thing we need to do is just pass in the, a, a file path to our data file that we, that we want to load. So the data file that we're going to load lives in um, is slightly different. The path is slightly different than what's in the in the notes here. So if you look at relative to our current location in the notebooks directory, so in the notebooks directory. The data lives in the data directory. 
So from the notebooks directory, we need to go up to the parent directory. And if you remember from our shell lesson, that means we use the dot dot to reference the parent directory. And then we go down into the data directory. And then once we're in the data directory, um, we can type the name of the file that we want. In this case, scatminder GDP Ocean. CSV. And we will assign this to the uh, data frame or to a, a variable called DF. Okay. And once we've done that, now we can look at, we can display this data frame a little bit and see, um, see what it looks like. So in this case, we see it has two rows and has quite a few columns. Um, the country is uh, in the first column and then other columns seem to be GDP, something called GDP per capita. Uh, and then in different years, like 1952, 1957, and so forth. Uh, GDP per capita means that GDP is gross domestic product. So it's like everything that was the uh, value of everything produced in that country uh, in that year. So in 1952, per capita means divided by the number of people. So it's like the amount of stuff produced per person in a country in a given year. And, okay, so let me... Take a look at the chat. Okay. Okay. So file not found. So many of you might have encountered a file not found error. If you, you know, if we did something like this, we would get a file not found error. So this is the type of error that you get when the read CSV function cannot find the CSV file at this path on your computer. And the reason it can't find this is that the path that I have put in here would be um, expecting there to be a data directory in the notebooks directory and then a CSV file in that directory. But there isn't a data directory here at all. And that's because from the notebooks directory, we need to go up to the parent directory and then down into data, down into the data directory. Okay. This is a very common error, these file not found errors. And it's one of the, um, one of the uh, tricky things about getting started with data analysis is often just making sure that you can read in your data files. Okay, um, given that the um, given that the data in our uh, data uh, data frame looks like it's kind of indexed by country, what this means is that um, if you each country, once you know the country name, that uniquely determines the values in the rest of, in the rest of the columns. So instead of zero and one, it would probably be better to use Australia and New Zealand as the, the indexes for the rows. And so we can do that by using, there is an index column option in the, uh, the read CSV function, and we can pass in the name of the column that we want to use as the index column. And so now we have Australia and New Zealand as the row indices. And this is going to be useful um, when we start talking about index, indexing and subsecting on um, of data frames because we can talk about indexing using countries instead of indexing using integers. 
Um, you can find out some more information about data frames. There's an, um, an info function that you can call, and it gives you information about a data frame. It tells you um, like what is the data type in each column. So these are all floating point numbers. Um, it tells you how many um, not missing values are there. So each column only has two values. So the fact that these are twos all the way down means that there's no missing data. Um, <clears throat> tells you how much memory is used by the data frame. Um, what else? So the, there is a columns a variable associated with the data frame. And this just gives you information about columns so you can get access to the column names in this way. You can uh, transpose, which means swapping rows for columns or vice versa uh, with uh, transpose. So here, instead of having um, rows Australia and New Zealand, we have rows indexed by um, a year, basically, and then index the columns are for individual countries. Um, if you want some summary statistics, you can do describe. So this will do um, means, standard deviations, and different quantiles like min, max, and 25, 50%, and 75% quantiles. Um, so your basic kind of summary statistics. Okay. Um, so there's some questions in here. So can I use an Excel or a text file in Python? Yes, absolutely. So if you have your data stored in an Excel file, actually Pandas has a read um, Excel file, which or read Excel function, which allows you to directly read in an Excel spreadsheet um, and, and get it into a data frame. So yes, you can also read Excel files directly. So reading text files is a bit more problematic because it depends on what actually, how the text file is, is structured um, as to whether or not you would be able to read it in. Um, so if the text file was structured, then you would probably be able to read it in using one of these read functions. Uh, but it would, you would need to know something about the structure of the, of the data file. <clears throat> okay. Okay. And so there's some questions about sharing the data. So this data is already available. It's in this, um, it's in the directory, in the data directory already. So as long as you remember to do the, the path to the data correctly, so relative to the notes, you need to add dot, dot, slash in front, you should be able to get access to this data and use it directly in just as I'm doing now. Okay. Um, so we're, now we have some more exercises. So I would like you to take five minutes and look through these exercises. In particular, um, the first two, so reading other data. So make sure that you can read the other data files. So there are the same data for different continents in here, and then a data file that has the whole world. You know, Practice changing the file path to make sure you understand how to read in these CSV files into data frames. Um, and then that's the most important of these. Uh, these exercises. So if you can't load it, it probably it must mean that you're you you're either getting an error like this, some kind of file not found error. Yeah. So the file not found error means that 
you're not correctly typing the path from the directory containing the notebook, which is in this notebooks directory, to the file containing the data. Right? So to get to the directory that holds the CSV files from the directory where our notebook lives, we need to go up one level to the introduction to Python directory. So that's the parent directory. So that's what's represented by the dot dot, followed by a slash. And then from this directory, we go into the data directory. And then inside the data directory, we have this, we have the CSV files. And you know, if you've made a typo in the file name, you will also get the same file not found there. So make sure you don't have any typos in the name. Um, but that data should be there. Um, so Can everybody see this introduction to Python directory? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, if you go back to, if you click on this file, you go all the way back to the, the, uh, the root of the file system for our, your compute instance, and you should be able to see introduction to Python. And then in there, there is the notebooks directory and the data directory. So, okay. If you're running in the cloud, if you're trying to run locally, then I, I can't help you because um, you have to install all the software and everything yourself. Okay, so go ahead and take a few minutes, work on these exercises. Um, I'll just set a timer for three minutes uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll pick up in a couple of minutes. Okay. All right. So I want to talk a little bit um, about, I can see people are still having trouble getting the data loaded. And um, so let's try, let's try something, something else. So it's possible that many of you have created this notebook somewhere else somewhere different than where I created it. So if you want to find out where you created your notebook and you're not entirely sure, then what you can do is you can do, you can use the bash, ma bash magic command and just type PWD. And so this will tell you where, your, where the notebook file that you created lives. In my case, it's in slash home slash Jovian slash introduction to Python. So here's introduction to Python, slash notebooks, notebooks. And then here's the file, that one, yeah. Now, in order to get the data file to read properly, we need to pass in the path Okay, sorry, thank you for letting me know I was not sharing my screen. Um, so we can use this bash command, pwd, and this is going to give us the path to where my notebook file lives. Yep. And so it is in home slash, slash home slash Jovian, which is just the user home inside of this compute instance, introduction to Python notebooks. So this is where I saved my notebook file at the very start of today's workshop. You may have saved your notebook somewhere else. Um, and if that's true, then, then this will, will look different. And that's okay. Um, but it might look different. If you saved it in, 
in this root directory, then it might just say slash home slash Joby. If you saved it in introduction to Python, it would just, it would show up here as a file down here somewhere, and it would have slash home slash Joby and slash introduction to Python. Now, the path that we pass in here to load the data needs to be the path to the data file from this directory. So that's why from the notebooks directory, we go dot dot to go up one layer in the file system hierarchy, which corresponds to, in this case, the introduction to Python, then down into the data directory, and then we have the gapminder CSV file. So you have to, whenever you are, that's why I spent so much time in the shell lesson talking about the concept of absolute paths versus relative paths. Um, if you wanted to pass, instead of a relative path, you could also do the following. Uh, Let's do maybe this would work. So, so this absolute path should work for everybody. So if we do the absolute path from slash home slash Jovian slash introduction to Python, so this should work for everybody. So here I'm passing in the absolute path from the root of the whole file system in our compute um, environment down to the data file. So no matter where you saved your um, notebook file, this absolute path should work. But this concept of absolute and relative paths is very, very important um, because it's what, it is what will allow you to load your data properly and efficiently. So you can always use an absolute path, but the problem with absolute paths is that depending on how deep your file system hierarchy is, the absolute path could be incredibly long versus the relative path is usually much shorter. Okay, cool. So if you're uncertain about absolute versus relative paths, you can uh, check out the shell workshop from a few weeks ago. Um, and there's a whole episode discussing the differences between absolute and relative paths. Okay. Okay. Um, there. Okay. So let's just. I'll, let me give. Let's give another example. So let's load. Um, So here I have loaded in um, the Gapminder GDP Americas CSV um, and used the country as the index column. Okay. And if we wanted to display the summary statistics, we could do describe. To get the summary statistics. Um, if we wanted to look at the first few rows, 
we could do americas.head. So that will look at the first five rows. If we wanted to do the first eight rows, we could put an eight in there and that would give us the first eight rows. Similarly, we could do uh, dot tail to look at the last, uh, the last few rows. So if we want to do the last three rows, we could look at the last three rows. Um, and if you recall back from our shell episode, again, we, we had head, there was a bash command called head and the bash command called tail. Um, you're going to recognize some of the, um, uh, some of the, the function names that we use on data frames because they derive from the same functionality in the bash, uh, um, in the bash world. Okay, um, so I'll just mention writing data. So we've been reading in CSVs, but in addition to, um, so read, there is also a bunch of um, functions that will write your data frame out to other, um, other file formats. So you can write to CSV, you can write to Excel files, um, you can write out to all different kinds of things. Um, each of these has their own utility depending on your use cases. And the thing to know is that if, if you need to write out to a particular format, your, your data frame, there probably already exists a, a function for doing it. Okay. Um, questions about reading in data before we move on? Nope. Okay, so let's move right along to pandas data frames. Okay, so we're gonna cover the um, kind of bulk of the basic ideas behind using pandas data frames um, in, this, uh, in this episode. So um, a pandas data frame is a collection of pandas series. So a pandas series is like a, um, a column of data with row indexes. And then, and the column of data will have its own particular data type. It could be a string, could be integers, could be floating point, could be something else. And then a data frame is just a collection of these series that share the same row indices which that basically makes a table. That's the way to think of it. So pandas is built on top of, um, on top of NumPy um, and it uses a lot of NumPy's underlying array manipulation operations to operate on tabular data. So um, for example, just like, um, and so let's load, let's load in some data. So let me go back up here. I'm just going to copy my, um, instead of Europe or instead of Americas, we're going to load Europe. Yeah, mind your GP, let's see what the name of the file is, um, Europe. Okay, so let's look at the first few lines of Europe. Okay, so just like we, you might index into uh, in a, a matrix with your I row and J column coordinates, we can do uh, we can do the same thing with a data frame using um, I lock or I loc. So that's in short for integer location. So now we use the square brackets because we're doing uh, integer location indexing. So anytime we're doing ind indexing, it's going to be a square bracket. So we could do zero, zero. And that gives us the zeroth row, zeroth column entry. So that's 1600 roughly, uh, which was the GDP per capita of Albania in 1952. Now, typically uh, we don't use, because we're, we're not actually working with you know, this kind of IJ um, 
index or integer based indexing makes sense when you're talking about matrices or arrays, but it doesn't really make sense when you're talking about labeled data, like a data frame where we have row labels and column labels. It's much more intuitive to uh, refer to the rows and columns we want by their labels, not by their, their integer indices. So we do that by um, using the loc location or label-based indexing. And so here we might say, well, give me the value of uh, Albania's uh, GDP per capita in 1952. And so we get the same answer. Now, usually we don't just want like one particular value. We usually want an entire row or entire column worth of, of data, at least. Um, so for example, if we wanted to do the, um, all of the data for France, we can use the colon to stand in for all of the columns in this case. So we want all the data in the row whose label is France, but then all of the values in all the columns. And so that gives us a, uh, a pandas series object whose row indices are GDP per capita in 1952 and whose name is, the column name is France, basically. Alternatively, we could do, um, from the Europe data frame, we could select out an entire, um, so let me just put a little comment in here. So, so selects an entire row of data. And this will be uh, selects an entire column. So to get an entire column of data, we will select all the rows and then we pick like um, I don't know, GP per cap. GDP per cap in 1967. So this gives me all the values for GDP per capita in 1967 for all the countries in Europe. Um, so we could do, if we want multiple rows, but we can still, use, we can use the labels to do multiple rows. So we could do something like um, Italy to Poland. And then, um, so these would be the, a subset of rows in all the columns. Um, or we could do a subset of the rows and a subset of the columns. So we could go uh, GDP per cap from 1957 to um, 1987. So there's a, a subset of, and I'll just change it. So there. So I guess the to sum up, you should prefer this location uh, based indexing over integer locations in almost all cases, and uh, you use this slice notation to select different rows and columns that you might want to uh, might want to use. Um, so we can use these subset of data um, in further calculations. So for example, suppose we wanted to compute the, um, the max value that 
the max value of uh, GDP per capita from these countries. So Italy, Montenegro, Netherlands, Norway, and Poland in these years. So what this does, or what, what this has done is gone through for each column and picked out the max value. So of these countries, Norway is probably the wealthiest, maybe the Netherlands in some years, but probably Norway. And so I would guess that in each of these years, Norway might have been the wealthiest. And so actually, the above is the same as this. Oh, no, um, oops, and in, in these years. Okay. Um, so, so we can assign, sometimes we will assign uh, subsets to their own variable just to make things a bit more legible. So if we, assign this particular subset of data that we're interested in to some new variable like subset, we can, then we can do things like say subset um, greater than uh, 10,000. Now, what this has done is it's gone through and for each um, data item in the table, it has run the comparison of is the value greater than 10,000 and return true if that's true and otherwise false. And so you can see here that um, you know, Montenegro, for example, had low values of GDP per capita. And so you see lots of false all the way through until 1982. Um, Poland has had low GDP per capita throughout this entire time period. Um, and so it's false all the way across. Norway and the Netherlands have been relative, were relatively wealthy. Um, and so they've had true all the way across, for example. Um, what if we want to select values um, where a condition is true and then fill in missing values everywhere else? So that's called masking. And we can do that um, really easily. Um, so we could say uh, subset, let me just give it an example. So we'll call this um, some condition, subset greater than 10,000. And then we can say the subset, and then we can use the square brackets to do indexing and we can use the condition to do the index. And so what this does is it goes through and anywhere where the condition is true, you get, instead of true, you get the actual value from the data table or the data frame. And where the, where the condition is false, you just get missing data. So this is a really, uh, this is really useful. So this can be useful, for example, if you want to filter out data before computing things like descriptive statistics. So now when we filter out the data using this condition to mask out values, then when we do the descriptive statistics, these, these uh, descriptive statistics are computed using only the, the values, only the values that are not masked out. 
So here it just computes using these two values. Here it uses these three values. And then by 1987, these four values will be used in computing these descriptive statistics. So that's a fairly, uh, fairly handy technique. Okay, now time for something um, a, a bit a bit tricky. Um, so we're going to talk about the this group by group by calculation. So split, apply, combine idea. Um, whenever you're attacking a uh, a data analysis problem, it's very useful to think in terms of what of a of a sequence of, of calculations called split, apply, combine. And the idea is that you want to take your original data set, which could be very large, and you want to think about how can I split it into chunks, apply some calculation to each chunk, and then combine the results to get usually a smaller um, data frame. Uh, and this is really a really useful way to think about do uh, structuring your data analysis because as you start working with larger amounts of data once you have split your data into chunks you can often process each of the chunks in parallel using multiple cores or even multiple nodes in a compute cluster depending on how big your data is so thinking in terms of split apply combine is a good um mental model to or a good way to think when you're doing when doing data analysis okay so um, let's give an example of this. So let's take our, um, our Europe, our Europe data. And let's calculate, um, let's calculate the mean. Okay. So what this has done is it's computed the average GDP per capita across all the countries in Europe for each year in the, in the data table. So that's for each column in the data. Okay. Now, let's ask when, let's look at this condition. So what this has done is for each country and each year in the data, it's asked, is the value of GDP per capita for that country greater than the average value for that year? So let's, uh, I'm gonna add a few more rows and let, let's look at this. Uh, Europe. And Europe me. Okay. So let's, I'm going to just pick some examples to show you how this, this calculation is going. So what this calculate or the, what this condition here is doing is it's taking, so for example, the GDP per capita for Albania in 1952, which was 1601, and asking, is 1601 greater than the mean across all of the European countries for GDP per capita in 1952? So that's in the same column. Is, so is 1600 greater than 5,661? Well, no, false. So that's why this is false. If we go over, let's, so let's look at Belgium in 1967. So Belgium in 1967, the GDP per capita was uh, 13,149. So let's compare 13,149 to the mean of GDP per capita in 1967. So that's the average across all the values in this column. So that is 10,143. So since 13,149 is greater than 10,143, it should be true. Uh, true. And so on and so forth. So that, that's what's going on. That's what this one line of code is doing. And it's creating this, this mask, this condition. Now, um, okay. 
So now what we can do is we can um, do a further calculation on this. So let's uh, get this out of the way and we will call this um, is richer than average. So I'm going to assign this um, this data frame, this Boolean mask data frame to a variable called is richer than average. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say is richer than average. And we can compute the mean of this. Um, but what we want is the mean not across um, the rows, but across the columns. Okay. So what this has done is now for each country, we have um, we have said what is the mm, what is the percentage of the time of that this country is richer than average. So, um, for example, let's look at so let's look at Austria. So Austria has true for every. Uh, every column. So that means every year, the GDP per capita in Austria was greater than the European average in that year. So that's like, um, so when we take the mean of these values here, so that's like the mean of these Booleans, true and falses, which get mapped into zeros for false and one for true, then that mean will turn into, um, if it's all true, it's like adding up, you know, one for each of these trues and then dividing by the number of columns. So that gives you a one overall. If you look at a country like Greece, that comes out to be 0.33. So 33% of the time or a third of the time, um, Greece was richer than average or wealthier than, than the European average in that year. So what we've done is we found a way to kind of group countries so countries that are relatively poor are going to have a score of zero, according to this uh, metric. Countries that are relatively rich are going to have a score of one, and then other countries are going to fall in between the different groups. So now what we can do is we can do things like we can take our European data and we can group by, um, and let's call this um, our wealth score. We can group by the wealth score, and then we can compute the mean. And now what we have a new data frame, which has grouped the countries into these bins. So depending on their wealth score. So we've got a bin of poor countries who are have a wealth score of zero, of rich countries have a wealth score of one, and for intermediate countries that have either one third or a half. And then these values are represent the average GDP per capita in 1952 across all countries whose wealth score was zero. So this is a way of doing this um, split apply combine. So um, the splitting is the grouping. So we did this um, somewhat involved calculation to come up with this wealth score, which then we use the wealth score to do the grouping, the splitting of the rows into different groups, into different bins, and then the apply 
is the mean operation. So then once we have the, the rows grouped into different bins, we apply the mean operation within the bin, and then we combine the results back into a single data. So it might take some, some deep thought on your part, but it is often the case that your um, cal the calculation that you want to perform on your data can be um, done with this split apply combine or this group by apply um, paradigm. So this is just a, a particular example of that. Okay. So that was a bit involved, more involved than some of the other stuff that we've, we've been doing so far. So let's take a, um, a few minutes and have a look at these, uh, these exercises. And um, also now might be a good time for just a short break. So maybe a five minute break, uh, and then we'll come and we'll push through to the end of, um, of the workshop today. So we'll come back at say, 10 after, um, so just in a few minutes, and then we'll push through to the end, uh, the end of the day. Okay, so we're back and that will be our last break before we end today. So the next thing that I want to talk about Uh, so I guess, so real quick, does anybody have any questions about those exercises? Did, did somebody come across an exercise that they were a bit stuck on and would like me to work through? Or should we just move on to the next section on, on plotting? Okay, so we'll just go ahead and move on to the next section on plotting. Okay. So plotting. So how can I plot my data? So that's what we're going to work on. And this, we're just going to scratch the surface. Visualization is obviously a huge topic uh, itself. And we're just going to scratch the surface. So. Um, Matplotlib is the most widely used uh, plotting library in Python. So we can take a look at, at Matplotlib. So here's the, the homepage for Matplotlib. They've got a handy cheat sheet here that you can uh, you can download, um, as well as a huge amount of um, of examples. So there's some examples, and if you want example, if you want code to generate certain plots you kind of just come to this examples and just kind of scroll through here until you find the plot that you want um that you want to reproduce and uh, let, let's pick one that looks uh that looks kind of interesting uh, let's go let's go to this one okay and so here they have a lot of, um, of discussion of the, the plot and how to, how to kind of make the plot work. And, um, and you could copy this code, paste it in the notebook and uh, it would run without, uh, uh, should run without, without issue. So that's how I would get, I would, whenever I need to get started on a, on a plot, um, I come to the matplotlib examples, go through, find an example that's kind of close to what I want to do, copy the code, paste it in the notebook, run the code, see that it works, and then try to go through and figure out um, how to change it to work with my data. Um, 
So let's see some, some kind of simpler examples. OK. Um, so first, we need to import the library. So we import uh, mat plot lib dot pyplot as plot. And someone is drawing on my screen. Let me see if I can figure out how to get rid of it. There we go. or not. Um, OK. So we need to import matplotlib.pyplot as plt plot. That's just the canonical way of importing uh, matplotlib. Then if we wanted to manually make a plot, we could do, uh, we could create a, a list of time values, one, and a list of, I don't know, position values and then we could just make a simple plot plot dot plot time and position and so that's a simple plot if we wanted to um, add an X label, we can do that. If we wanted to add a Y label, do that. So position kilometers, time in seconds. And if we wanted to add a title, we could add a title. Um, my first plot. Right. OK, things like this. Now, when we're plotting with um, data frames, there's some handy kind of built-in features to plot data frames. So um, let's so we're going to read in our data from Gotten how these files are named again. Okay. Um, now what we can do is so now we have our data frame. Um, but I actually want to change the, I'm going to make some changes to this data frame. But first, let's just plot it. So there's a nice method called dot plot. And you plot it and you get, in this case, we get a graph or a plot. But it's not at all the plot that we want to get. Um, because what has happened is that um, by default, we get one line plot per column. Yep. So here we have a little legend that's mapping colors to individual columns. But that's not what we want, really. Because remember, the data is organized by 
where each country is is really kind of what is indexing the data. So we have each row and then we have all these columns. What we really want is to plot the GDP per capita over time for each country. But remember how I said you could swap rows and columns with transpose. So if we do transpose.plot, this is a little better, but this is a bit messy. And the reason that's a bit messy is because our column names are, are complicated GDP per capita in 1952 and not just like 1952, like the year. So we can fix that with a little bit of manipulation. So for example, if we do, remember we looked at the columns uh, data or the columns variable for a data frame. So if we want to, so suppose that we want to apply some transformation to each of the strings here. So these are individual strings in this kind of list like object. So we can do that. There is a dot string, which allows us to apply string methods to each individual uh, entry. Um, uh, in this index. And there's a string method called strip. And this strip method allows you to remove text from a string. So in particular, we are going to remove the GDP per cap. So then what we get back is a, um, these cleaned up strings. But this is almost right, because actually then what we want to do is cast the data from a string uh, to an integer type. And so now we get integers. So then what we want to do is to kind of replace um, if we call this uh, years. And then just to make this a little bit easier to read, I like to do something um, you'll often see uh, complicated data transforms stored like this in Python. So then what we can do is replace the columns with the years. And now when we can redo the plot, and now we have this nicely formatted access here. So this is a, a bit of an example of the kind of like data cleaning that is, is fairly typical um, when you get kind of messy raw data that you need to manipulate a little bit before you, you do some analysis. So this is kind of a, a bit of a contrived example of that. Um, in practice, what I would probably do is I would do this code once and then I would write out, uh, I would store the, re, rewrite the CSV files so that they're cleaned up so that this code only has to be run once as like a, a cleaning step and then, it, and then it's not done again. Um, but really this is just cleaning up this plot. Okay. Um, if we wanted to just plot um, one country, we could do uh, from Oceana dot transpose. We could so we could select out all the rows for the column called uh, New Zealand. And then we could plot it. So that's an example of that. Uh, so there's many kinds of plots that you can do. So by default, you get um, you get just line plots, but you could do there's a um, kind keyword uh, which you can do bar chart, um, 
all the plots have a default styling. So if, for example, you like, you would want to change the style. Uh, there's a, a plotting package in R, which is very popular aesthetically, like the, the color schemes and everything are, are very popular. Um, so you could change your style to GD plots, and then all your plots from here on out would look like and uh, have that kind of color styling. Um, uh, uh, what are some other examples here? So So here we've been using the, the data frame methods to plot. And so let's see another example of that. So we should be able to do dot um, There's a way to do a scatter. So I think we can do a scatter plot of a scatter plot of the Australia GDP per capita versus New Zealand GDP per capita like this. Um, so you can use, if you select out the data on your own, or like in this example here, where we select out Australia, we can use the plot, um, the matplotlib plot method directly um, to plot data instead of using the built-in plot with pandas. But I prefer to use the built-in plot. Um, so there's some more examples here of adding, um, adding legends and things. Um, we just did the scatter plot example. Okay. Um, all right. So it's about four 30. So we can go through some more plotting examples or let's see what's next. Hmm. Probably best to just end on some more plotting examples. Okay. Um, all right, let's give you some opportunities to, to do some plotting exercises. So take a look at these exercises. Um, and I will also pick a couple of exercises to, uh, uh, to work through. Um, and and then I think we'll probably wrap it up. I'll leave some time for, for Q and A and then, um, uh, and then we'll wrap it up.
Okay. Um, so one of the exercises actually asks you to um, to look at this data for the whole world. Um, so there's this Gapminder all CSV file. And this is a good example to show how you can have multiple columns index a, a data set. So here, if we do the same kind of data loading code from before, we're indexing by country. But actually, now we have two columns that index um, the rows. We have uh, country and continent. And um, so we could do, um, or we could actually do it the other way around, continent and then country. So continent and then country. So you can actually list multiple columns. And now if you look at it, we have, um, we have a data set where we could, um, we can do location based on, say we can grab all the countries in Africa in one go. And now we can get a data frame that looks like, or get a data frame for all the countries in Africa in one go. So this is a really um, good way. So thinking clearly about how to index your data is really important. And so this is an example of how in Pandas you can use multiple uh, columns in your raw data to index your data frame. So now what I'm going to do <clears throat> is um, is we're going to create a plot of um, the correlation between GDP per capita and life expectancy. So we have more data than just GDP per capita. Um, we also have population uh, data for these countries and then also data on life expectancy. So how long are people likely to live? So what we can do now is we can do world um, and we can plot and we can do a scatter plot. And for our column, we can look at the uh, GDP uh, per capita in 2007 and uh, life expectancy in 2007. So let's just look at the scatter plot. Okay. So what this is saying is that um, the higher levels of GDP and you have higher life expectancy, but the, the, so as countries get wealthier, the population tends to live longer, but you can see that it's not like a, a linear relationship because there is a huge difference in life expectancy when you go from, you know, being incredibly poor. So having extremely low values, you know, up to say 10,000. So there's a big spike jump up in life expectancy when you go from having basically nothing to being relatively poor, but then it's kind of flat. So adding, you know, even increasing your GDP per capita by a factor of five, you know, only increases your life expectancy by just looking at it maybe like five years or something like that on, on average, something like this. So we can um, change this plot a little bit by, um, by adjusting the size of the markers. So the size of the dots um, by, Um, population oh 
that's crazy. What's happened here? Well, what, the reason that it's happened here is that the population are in millions of people. So we need to rescale them to avoid this, um, to avoid this. And the way that we can do that is by um, saying world location and then dividing that by uh, a million. And so that changes everything. So that would be another example of a kind of a plot that, that you could do. Um, if you're wondering about the code, so today's code, so I'm going to save this notebook um, and then I will upload it to the GitHub repository so that um, my, my notes will always be there. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll do that now. So if I go to um, introduction to Python and notebooks, and I'm going to right click and then I can do uh, rename. I'm going to call this uh, sandbox. And then um, I'll save it. And then I can do uh, file and, and uh, download. And this will download my this notebook on this is downloading it from the cloud computing resource um, down to my computer. And then I will upload this to GitHub um, when we're done. And then that will give you all of my code that I wrote today in this notebook as a reference uh, to go along with um, whatever your own code that you have. And of course, you can download this notebook yourself if you want. Um, remember, it's file and then download. We'll download that notebook for you. OK. OK. Well. I don't know about you, but it has been a long, uh, long afternoon. So let me just talk through the, the rest of the notes um, so that you maybe know some other things to, to look at. Um, so I tried to, to just give you a bit of an overview into Python, give you some examples of pandas and, and, and things uh, and some basic plotting, just enough to try to get you over that initial entry barrier so that you can um, kind of pursue more in your own time. So the things that of the, the remaining episodes that we didn't cover, uh, so for loops, conditionals, and looping over data sets, um, I had hoped to get to today, um, but there's not going to be time to, to cover any of those topics, unfortunately. Um, and then writing functions is another uh, another important one. Um, if you come along to the um, advanced workshops that I'll be having in the in the spring, we will kind of just jump right into doing that. So we'll be doing scikit-learn and PyTorch, and we'll be writing for loops and and functions, lots of functions and and things. So it would be good uh, to to have a look through some of that material, at least familiarize yourself with it, if you intend to to take the advanced workshops where we'll focus more on, uh, on applications um, in the spring. Um, so, so now let's, um, let's uh, just have some time for Q and A. So question in the chat. So what is the best way to grow someone's data science portfolio? So this is a great question. Um, 
my recommendation would be to um, to use to use a um, something like Kaggle. So let me let me share my screen again. So if I was just getting started today uh, with my kind of my journey towards learning more about data science and machine learning, and um, and I was very focused on wanting to develop skills to be to apply these tools to solve new problems, I would start by uh, creating an account on um, uh, Kaggle, or there's another one called is it Zim. Uh, Zindi. Um, so either Kaggle, um, and then with Kaggle, you can both get practice in solving or in applying these techniques to solve novel problems, but you can also, um, you know, win awards and earn points and kind of build up a reputation for yourself as a Kaggler, and that is actually quite useful in um, building up a portfolio of work. Uh, because you can then take your uh, your work that you've done on Kaggle and share it um, on GitHub. So Zin so Zindi is a um, a Kaggle like uh, platform for competition, but it's specifically focused on um, African data sets. And I find that they have a, a some really interesting data sets that don't get nearly as much um, attention as Kaggle. So there's a lot more scope for doing, uh, quickly doing new and interesting things on these data sets on Zindi than you might find on Kaggle where you'll already find a notebook on Kaggle to, for every possible combination of machine learning or deep learning application that you might want on particular competition because there are so many people who are who are doing Kaggle, but so get on one of these competition websites, practice your, uh, your modeling and your coding skills, and then, um, go to, uh, GitHub and create an account on GitHub and start sharing your, uh, your work on GitHub. So that is the, your GitHub profile is kind of become your, um, your CV in a way, um, if you're doing data science or machine learning. So you can use your code that you've posted on GitHub as an example of the work that you can do. And so those would be the two things that I would do. Focus on developing your machine learning, your data science skills, by participating in these competitions on Kaggle or Zindi or, or another competition platform. Um, and then share your work um, on GitHub. And next week, we're going to focus on Git and GitHub. And you'll, you will learn, if you come next week, you'll learn the, the basic mechanics of how to use GitHub um, to both um, control keep track of all the different versions of your your code and your project files but also how to share things on github um, so if you want a kind of a brief introduction to how to do that and definitely come along next week any other questions let me share those links um, in the chat Okay, so you missed them. So there's the link for Kaggle, the link for Zindi, and the link for GitHub. Any other questions about um, uh, about Python uh, programming? Uh, let's see. Here's another good resource. Um, uh, 
Uh, just a second, I'm gonna put it up on Google. Uh, okay, um, so I didn't go to the, the pandas uh, pandas webpage earlier, but I meant to. So a great if you really want to learn how to use uh, use pandas, then there's a book called Python for Data Analysis by Wes McKinney, um, and there's a link to it uh, on the uh, the pandas website. Um, so I'll put that in the chat as well. So the link there takes you to Amazon. Um, if you are, if if you are, so if you're at Calst, then most of these O'Reilly books, including the Python for Data Analysis, are available through University Library. Um, and if you're outside of Calst and at your at a university somewhere in Saudi Arabia, you may also have access to them as well through your university library. Um, otherwise, um, you you can search about for them online uh, if you um, if you want. Um, but that's a great resource for learning in detail how to program in pandas. So everything I know about pandas, I learned by going through that book kind of from cover to cover. It took me about um it took me several months when i was in grad school and with the first edition of that book um when it came out i went through it cover to cover and it took me several months when i was in grad school um and had to, had time for uh for such things but it's a great reference resource the second the second edition you definitely want the second edition um because there's been quite a lot of, of changes um and the second edition came out i think last year so it's it's still pretty current um so other than that i think i'm i'm done i don't have anything else to say unless someone has questions I'll, I'll hang around for a few minutes to see if anybody has questions but otherwise thank you so much for coming and um, um like i said next week we'll be talking about git and github and then the following week we'll we'll wrap up the workshop series by looking at um sql which is a structured query language for uh extracting data from databases um, and we'll, we'll be using Jupyter Lab in next week and in the, the week when we talk about SQL. So thank you very much for coming and staying with me for this afternoon. And like I said, I'll hang around for a few more minutes or until everybody leaves if there are questions. And I will send around the link for the uh, the video on YouTube sometime um, sometime tomorrow after I've had a chance to upload, edit the video and, and upload it. Okay, any uh, any last minute questions? Doesn't seem like it. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'll see you next week.